Tonight I want to continue about what to expect when reading the Bible through. I want you to find the book of Isaiah, okay? Now there's the, the five books of law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. A lot of history in those five books. <clears throat> then the next 12 books are books of history, and we went over that. And then we had those five books of wisdom poetry. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. <clears throat> and now we've come to the prophets. So I want you to turn to Isaiah. I'm going to try tonight to go from Isaiah to Malachi. So that is a lot of ground to cover. In fact, if you pick up your Bible and look, you just think how much of the Bible that is. That's all the way from Isaiah to the end of the Old Testament. There are 17 books there. 16 prophets and 17 books. Now, if you're reading the Bible through and you come to this section of the prophets, what, what is it you expect? I think if, if you know what you're expecting to read, it'll make it easier to read this and to get into it and to, and to see the value that you can gather from it. Now, there are the prophets. What is a prophet? Let's get that in order first. Usually, when we think of a prophet, we think of someone that can tell what's going to happen in the future, don't we? One that prophesies about what's happening in the future. And every one of these prophets do that to some extent. But a prophet is mostly, instead of one that foretells, while he does foretell, a prophet is one that foretells. Think of a foretelling. God sent messages to the prophets. And the prophets delivered that message. And for the most part, they delivered that message by preaching. And so when we're looking at those 16 prophets, one of the ways you can look at that is these are 16 preachers. Now they're preachers that have a message from God inspired by the Spirit and they tell about things that are going to happen, but primarily what they're doing is they are preaching. Now, when you read through the book of the prophets, books of the prophets, you're going to read a lot of sermons. And I want to show you how this is done. Get ready now. Isaiah chapter 1. It starts off with a sermon. Now, I'll tell you what I did. When I was a, a young man, I had a wonderful job. I was a night watchman at the Mid-South Youth Camp. And so I had my duties. I had to get up, make sure everybody got to their cabins at the end and, and get lights out. You know, that was one of my duties. And then I went down and cleaned up the mess hall. And then I made my rounds around the, the campus, make sure everything is quiet and all right. And by then now we're into the wee hours of the morning. And my job was to stay awake until the morning <laughs> in case the phone rang or something. This is one of the things that I did. I started reading from the prophets. You think, how is that going to keep you awake? Well, the way I did that was I read them out loud. I started in Isaiah, and I didn't get through. I just stayed in Isaiah the whole time. But I decided this. There was a pulpit there, and I would open Isaiah up, and I'd stand behind that pulpit. And I would read these things and I, like I was Isaiah preaching them. See, that's what I would do. And so I thought, well, if I'm going to be a preacher someday, I'm going to learn how to preach from the prophet. And I would just read their sermons like I, I mean, I was the only one down there, so no one could see me. And, and it kept me awake and I'd hear my voice there in that mess hall reading from the prophets just like I was that preacher. You can imagine a young man doing that. Well, let me show you how that goes. Turn to Isaiah chapter 1. I'm going to begin reading in verse 2. Now, you talk about sermons. Every now and then, you talk about a preacher that will step on your toes. Have you ever heard about preachers doing that? I'll tell you what. You think you may have heard some preachers speaking very boldly sometime about things and getting real particular and, and coming down on people. You read the prophets. 
Read how they would preach, and you'll, you'll learn where it is that preachers get this, where they feel like they need to do that. Look what Isaiah does in this sermon. <clears throat> I'm going to read from verse 2, and I won't read the entire sermon, but I'm going to read through verse 20 here, okay? Imagine you're hearing Isaiah preach. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, the seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel to anger. They are gone away backward. Why should ye be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick. The whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there's no soundness in it but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. Have they not been closed? Neither have they been bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land, strangers devoured in your presence, and it is desolate, is overthrown by strangers. And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Except the Lord of hosts had given us a very small remnant. We should have been as Sodom. We should have been likened to Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I'm full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. And I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand? To tread my courts. Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity. Even the solemn meeting, your new moons, your appointed feast, my soul hateth. They are trouble unto me. I'm weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you. Make you clean. Put away this evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widows. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse... And rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Now, can you imagine hearing sermons like that? That's just the, the first 20 verses there of Isaiah, where you go on and on reading. And that's how to read the prophets. As you read them, when you're sitting in your quiet and you're reading them, I want you to hear the voice of a preacher preaching these things. And think how it would be to sit and to listen to him preach. Now we talk about major and minor prophets. It doesn't mean that some prophets are more important than the others. All that is really talking about is the length of their prophecy. There's four major prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Now there's another book in there called the Book of Lamentations and, and that goes with, with the, the book of Jeremiah. So there's five books, but there's four major prophets. And then the other prophets, the books aren't as long. Uh, that, it's not that they preach shorter sermons. Maybe you just have one sermon from them or one or two sermons instead of 
many, many, like you do with Isaiah and Ezekiel, you know. So, but they're not any less important. In fact, some of the very important passages are found in those uh, minor prophets. And the prophets prophesied over four periods of Israel's history. Some of them were prophesying during that period of the divided kingdom that we're studying about on Wednesday night where you had a king in northern Israel and a king in southern Judah. Some of them are prophesying after Israel had been carried away into captivity and it's just Judah there alone. Some of them are prophesying during the period of captivity after Nebuchadnezzar takes Jerusalem and burns the city to the ground and carries the captives away. So we got... Got two prophets there, that's uh, Ezekiel and, and Daniel that prophesied during that captivity. And then at the latter part, you've got some prophets that are prophesying after they had returned from that captivity and they're back in their homeland. So it covers a broad span of history. And if you can kind of understand the historical context of what the prophets are, are speaking, well then, then it helps understand them. Now here's what they do in summary. The prophets, in one word, the word of the prophet is repent. That's what these 17 books are telling us. Repent. And the way the prophet is motivating the people to repent is by one, he is warning them about the wrath of God. Now that's what Isaiah is doing in the first chapter of Isaiah, the wrath of God. But the second thing that he is doing is he is reminding them that God has a plan for them. And through them, he's going to work out that promise that he promised to Abraham that all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And that's why they need to repent so that God can use them for his purpose. So that pretty well sums up the message of those prophets. So there's a lot of fiery preaching about the wrath of God in these books. But there's also that hopeful preaching and talking about glorious days to come. And so much of what those prophets spoke about finds its fulfillment in the New Testament. And so you come to the New Testament and the, the writer will tell you that this is that which was spoken by the prophet and point back to that, you see. And so that's what you have. Now, here's what I'm going to try to do. I'm going to try to introduce to you 16 prophets. So we're going to have to kind of skip, skip through this. And it'll just, it won't be a fair <laughs> introduction because they deserve a larger introduction than what I'm going to give. But just let me tell you, and here's, here's what I want you to do. Take your Bible, start in Isaiah, Isaiah. And then as we get through Isaiah, turn to the next prophet and you'll get an idea at least of the length of the prophet and kind of follow up with me as we now go through those Old Testament and one by one, let me introduce these prophets that are going to be preaching to you when you read this part of the Bible. Isaiah. Isaiah is the statesman prophet. Isaiah is prophesying in Jerusalem, mostly to the, to the leaders of the people. In fact, he is of that that family among those leaders, somewhat associated in there with them. The, the book of Isaiah itself is sometimes called the Little Bible. Now let me tell you why they call it that. There are 66 books in the Bible. And the way we have divided chapters, we've divided the book of Isaiah into 66 chapters. There are 39 books in the Old Testament. And the first 39 books, uh, or first 39 chapters of Isaiah are very largely about the wrath of God. That's what, what, what the, the majority of that part is about. There are 27 books in the New Testament. And beginning in Isaiah 40, in those last 27 books, He's talking about the great days that are to come. And they're very hopeful messages, talking about the, the Messiah that would come. And so it's sometimes called the, the little Bible. I think that's interesting. Now, now, we're the one that divided it into those chapters, but still, the way that fit out there is real interesting. 
You remember how I read from that first chapter how he is calling those people who says you are Sodom, you are Gomorrah, and, and preaching on the wrath of God. Look how it changes. Isaiah 40. Listen to this sermon. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Speak comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned. For she hath received of the Lord's hand double for her sins, the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Isn't that beautiful? Well, now we know those are fulfilled. That's what John the Baptist came to do, to prepare that way for the Lord. And so it's talking about those glorious days of comfort that are to come. And that pretty well sums up Isaiah. Isaiah is the prophet that prophesied that the virgin would be with child and bring forth a son and call his name Emmanuel. Isaiah is the one that prophesied of that suffering servant who hath borne our sins and iniquities and in whose stripes we are healed. And so you'll read that about Isaiah when you read through the book of Isaiah. You'll remember Philip, when, when he went and joined the eunuch, in his chariot, the eunuch was reading from the prophet Isaiah. And Philip began at the same place he was reading and preached unto him Jesus. And so when you read through Isaiah, particularly that latter part, be watchful. Because of what you know about Jesus, you're going to be familiar with a lot of the things you'll read. And you'll understand more about it than the, than the Ethiopian did when he was in his chariot. Because you know what the New Testament teaches, and he didn't. That's what Philip was explaining to him. Okay, next prophet, Jeremiah. Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. He prophesied about a hundred years after Isaiah. Jeremiah had a message of woe, woe, woe. He was telling the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Nebuchadnezzar is bringing his army to Jerusalem, and here's what you need to do. You need to surrender and go ahead and make your home in Babylon and do the best you can because the Lord is bringing his judgment on Jerusalem. And it's not that Jeremiah liked preaching this. In fact, the people did not want to hear it. They would consider him a traitor. He's telling them what the Lord said. He's warning them about that is because of their sins. At the end of Jeremiah, you have the little book of Lamentations. You know what a lamentation is? That, that's a, that, that, and that is whoa, whoa, whoa. And in the book of Lamentations, you have five poems, five songs that Isaiah sings about the destruction of Jerusalem. Right? could have fit in the poetry books there. But there you have Jeremiah. Jeremiah is the prophet. That said God will establish a new covenant with his people. Not like the old covenant. But a new covenant that won't be written in stone. But it will be written on the hearts. And we find that new covenant being fulfilled. In the New Testament. Ezekiel. Well. He's a prophet of the captivity. He's a very. Uh, interesting prophet. In the, in the things that he would do to prophesy. And, and he would see all these visions. And he's kind of a prophet to the common people. But you know, you know some of the visions of Ezekiel. The, the Ezekiel saw the wheel way in the middle of the air. You remember singing that old song? And, and the wheel within the wheel. And he would describe the glory of God and the inner workings of how God did things and, and that kind of language. One of the more interesting visions of Ezekiel. Now remember, he's in the he's with the captives in captivity, preaching to the people. And it looks like things are over for Israel, doesn't it? It looks like the, the whole thing with the Jews is it, just dead and gone. And he said, The Lord sent me to prophesy, and he sent me down in a valley, and the valley was full of dead bones. Bones, dry bones across the valley. And the Lord said, Preach to those bones. And so Ezekiel preaches to the valley of dry bones. 
while he's preaching, those bones start moving. And they start joining up one joint next to another. And then they stand up on their feet and they are covered in flesh. And by the time he's through with this sermon, there stands a great army. Well, he's preaching about the restoration of Israel. It might look like it's all over, but hear the word of the Lord, you dry bones. God's going to bring this all back. And so that's the kind of way that, that Ezekiel preaches. Ezekiel is set upon a mountain and looks up and he sees this great vision of the great city and a great temple that's going to be restored, unlike any city or unlike any temple you've ever heard of. And sure, it's like like. Israel coming back, but it's hard to read those passages without thinking, too, of the church that God is going to establish, his temple there, and the city of God that is to come under the Messiah. Daniel. Daniel's the wise prophet of the captivity. Uh, you hear a lot about it, the history of Daniel. When he's a young boy, he's carried away by Nebuchadnezzar into captivity. And when he got over there, he would not eat the king's meat. And as a result of refusing the food that the Israelites were not supposed to eat, he looked better and stronger and healthier than all the other young men that they had brought back. And then you read about his friend, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego going through the fiery furnace. And you read about Daniel, you know, being cast into the lion's den. And you read about Daniel, he's an old man. And, and that, that great party that Belshazzar was having when he saw the finger writing on the wall, meanie, meanie, tinkle, you farson. Why? It says the king was so nervous, his, his knees smote one against the other. And uh, Daniel said, I can tell you, read to that what that means. You've been weighed in the balances and found wanting, and this night your kingdom will be taken from you. And that's what happened. So you read some of the history of Daniel, but then you also read about Daniel interpreting dreams. And he interprets that dream Nebuchadnezzar had about the great head of gold and the, and the arms and, and breast of silver and the belly and thighs of brass and the legs of iron and how he explained that's the, the rise and fall of the kingdoms through the years until that stone made without hands will come out of the mountain, strike the image of the feet and fill the whole earth, the coming of the kingdom of God. Now in the latter part of Daniel, you might think you're reading the book of Revelation. There's a lot of apocalyptic language in Daniel. And he's covering that period largely, that period between the Testaments. And so you kind of have history, prehistory. It's kind of in preview of what's going to happen between the Old Testament and the New Testament in the book of Daniel. Now, let's go to Hosea, first of the minor prophets. The prophet with a broken heart. His wife was not faithful. She bore him children, but were they his? He said, not mine. She ran off with her lovers who were giving her all kinds of gifts and special things and left him with those children. And then later, after they had done all they wanted to with her, they had her up on an auction block and they were going to sell her off. And Hosea goes to the auction and makes the bid to buy her back. You don't think he was a man that was hurt having been treated that way? And yet he loved his wife. And after that, God goes to Hosea and he says, okay, now you know how I feel. That's what Israel has done to me. After all I've done for her, she's going after, after all these false gods and being unfaithful to me, but I still love her. Now you go preach to them. And so Hosea is the prophet with a broken heart. Joel. Of all the prophets, Joel is probably the most difficult to date. I've tried to weed through this, and I, I don't have any confidence in it. Some, some date Joel earlier than all the other of the minor prophets, and some date him, no, he, he's way late, one of the latter prophets. To, and so they really don't know the time in which Joel preached, but we know his prophecy. And it sounds like Joel was a farmer prophet. 
He talks about a plague of locusts coming up on the land as a great army devouring everything in its path. And it sounds like he's warning them of a real army that is going to come across Israel and devour them. Joel is called the prophet of Pentecost. Because when Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost and they see what is going on, he said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Joel's prophecy, Joel 2, is fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. Amos, he's one of my favorite prophets. He's the rustic prophet. Amos is from a little, little old tough town out on the side of the desert nearly, the, the town of Tekoa. He, he said, I'm, I'm not, I wasn't born to a family of prophets. I'm, I'm neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet. Well, I'm a keeper of sheep and a dresser of sycamore trees. So, so here he is, this rustic man, and, and he takes him out of this little tough little town there out in southern Judah, and Amos is sent to the city in northern Israel. It'd be like taking a boy out of South Alabama and said, I want you to go preach in Chicago and straighten them out. Well, how, how do you think they would receive him up there when he got to Chicago? You know, this, this boy coming out of South Alabama up there to, to work them over it. And I'll tell you, Amos, he didn't shirk from his duty either. Amos, you read through it, he is roaring like a lion in his prophecies. And he gives no quarters. He, he tells them exactly what it is they need to hear. And it's almost as though the Lord sent him because he knew they wouldn't like what he had to say. One of the things Amos preaches is, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So there's your prophet Amos. Obadiah. Obadiah prophesies about Edom. Now, Edom are the descendants of Esau. Remember Jacob and Esau? Jacob's name changed to Israel. There's your children of Israel. So it's kind of a sister nation. Edom over there, the descendants of Esau. And yet, when Nebuchadnezzar comes up and he runs through and destroys Jerusalem, the children of Edom are over there just cheering Nebuchadnezzar on. And so Obadiah says, okay, Edom, the way you cheered when you saw your brother falling, you just wait. It's going to happen to you. And so that's what Obadiah's prophecy is to Edom. Jonah. Now you know the story of Jonah. In fact, Jonah is mostly a story. There's very little preaching in Jonah. Now, Jonah has one of the shortest sermons you'll ever read about in all the Bible. In 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. Now that was his message. And it's one of the most effective messages. Everybody in Nineveh repented. He's one of the most successful preachers you read about. That shows the power of short sermons, doesn't it? I, but I'll tell you this. This idea that people don't know, don't care how much you know unless they know how much you care, that didn't work with Jonah. He hated the Ninevites. In fact, that's why he didn't want to go. He didn't want to go preach to them. He just wanted the Lord to destroy him without him even going. And so here he is, a hateful prophet in Nineveh, telling them they're going to be destroyed and then when they weren't destroyed, he was all upset about it. And he got mad about it. You see, Jonah, you can divide Jonah into four chapters like this. Running from God, chapter 1. God told him to go preach to Nineveh. He didn't want to go. So he got on a boat and started it out the other way. But then, you know, they threw him over and he got swallowed by the great fish. Chapter 2. Running to God. And the belly of that fish, he had a change of heart. And he is praying to God to get him out of this mess. Chapter 3, running with God. Jonah does just what he's supposed to do, and he goes to Nineveh and prophesies to them. But then chapter 4, running against God. Because now he's all upset because God didn't destroy Nineveh. He wanted to see, he said, I knew you were a merciful God, and that's why I didn't want to come. And, and so here he's a successful, and he's angry about his own success in his preaching. It's a very interesting story, that story of Jonah. Let's go to the next one, Micah. Now Micah's a small town prophet. Micah prophesies at the same time Isaiah does. But Isaiah, see, he's in Jerusalem. 
And Micah, he prophesies in the little villages and towns in Judea. If, and I, this may not be a fair way to put it, but think of Isaiah as a big Nashville preacher, and Micah, he'd be the Warren County preacher. That's what he would be. So he prophesied in the little villages and towns out there. And he has the same prophecy, pretty much. In fact, some of the words are almost quoted. He says, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and all nations shall flow into it. And the word of the Lord shall go forth from Jerusalem. Well, both Isaiah and Micah made that same prophecy. And we know what that's about. That's about the Lord's church. It's going to be established in Jerusalem and the word going forth from there. And so they're, they're contemporary prophets in that manner. Nahum. Nahum prophesies about Nineveh. You got two. That's Jonah and Nahum. Jonah's about Nineveh, but Nahum is too. When Jonah prophesies about Nineveh, Nineveh repented. Now he didn't pay any attention to Nahum. He's prophesying in Israel about what's going to happen to Nineveh and there's no room for repentance now and Nineveh is destroyed. It, Nineveh was so destroyed that they lost it. I, they didn't know where it was till about the 1800s. That's when they, they, the archaeologists finally found where that city was and that's what Nahum said was going to happen to it. So the great city of, Nah of Nineveh was destroyed. Habakkuk. The complaining prophet. Habakkuk saying, Lord, look at all this. Look at this mess. Look, look at all this sin. Look, look what's going on. When are you going to do something about this? How long is this going to go on? He's complaining about it. And then the Lord told Habakkuk, says, I am going to show you a thing. You would not believe it, though someone told you. And when he explained to Habakkuk what he was about to do, Habakkuk changes his tune. And it's like, well... Is there going to be any mercy? Uh, he didn't know the Lord was as angry as he was. And the Lord explains to him, and that's where we get this beautiful expression, the just shall live by faith. That's one of the messages of Habakkuk. Zephaniah. Zephaniah is the prophet of the day of the Lord. I read quickly through this, and so I didn't, I didn't read this from somebody. I just read quickly through the book of Zephaniah. I think he makes reference to the day of the Lord 17 times in that little book. A lot of time we think of the day of the Lord as the last day of the world when the Lord returns. And that is going to be a day of the Lord, and maybe even the day when you think of it as the last day. Day because it's the coming of the Lord in judgment. But, but the prophet Zephaniah is not talking about the last day of the world. He's just talking about the Lord coming in judgment. And that's what the day of the Lord is really talking about. And kind of like Isaiah. The most of the book is about the day of the Lord's wrath. And right at the last of the book, it's the day of the Lord's blessings and his mercy, you see. And so there's the prophet Zephaniah. Haggai. Haggai is prophesying after the children of Israel had returned. Remember, we read about that in the history, or we talked about that, of uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. They came back, they were supposed to rebuild the temple, and, and they got started on it. But they quit. That They got distracted. Instead, they went home and built their own houses. And man, they had nice homes. They had sealed uh, sealed ceilings in their houses, you know. They were really fixing their houses up. And Haggai comes and says, why would you neglect the Lord's house and you're spending all your time working on your own house? He says, you need to get back doing what you're supposed to do with the Lord's house. And he told them this. He said, the glory of the latter temple will be greater than the glory of the former temple. Well, that sounds like the latter temple of his church that he's going to stand. Not a physical temple, but he's pointing on forward to that. Sounds like to me he's talking about the spiritual temple to come. Zechariah, of all the books in the Bible, I think Zechariah is the most difficult book. It's another prophet that speaks in apocalyptic language. And all those visions, what do they mean? You read that and think, I know this means something. What is he talking about? And 
I have read the commentaries. And the commentaries will tell you, now this is what Zephaniah is talking about. But you're wondering, oh, Zechariah, this is what Zechariah is talking about. But then I wonder, well, how do they know that? You almost have to take the, the commentators by faith when they're explaining to you the meaning of this book. And I think, and I don't know this, but I think some of the understanding and interpretation of Zechariah is, is just passed down by tradition. And they're just copying. This is what people's always said they thought this meant because it's, it's very difficult to peer through those visions and know exactly what he's talking about. Now, the more I've thought about it and studied it, every time I go over it, I get a little more confidence. But, but I promise you, that's going to be a difficult book for you to read with understanding. But, but those visions are very interesting to read about. And sometimes he's not talking about Israel at all. He's looking past Israel He's the one that talks about one that is going to come both as a king and as a priest to sit on his throne. And he tells you he's going to come into Jerusalem riding upon the colt of an ass. He's going to tell you that he'll be sold for 30 pieces of silver. Well, we got the New Testament. We know what he's talking about. Even if they didn't know when they heard him preach. They said, I don't know what this prophet's preaching about. But some of that we know because that is fulfilled by Christ in the New Testament. And we got those passages that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. And then the quotation from the book of Zechariah. And then we come to Malachi, the last prophet. Malachi is preaching against the sins of of the priest and of the people. And listen to some of the things Malachi says. Now remember, it's right at the end of the Old Testament. And Malachi says in Malachi 3 and verse 1, Behold, I will send my messenger. He shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. And then in Malachi 4, verses 5 and 6. Now we're right down now to the very last two verses of the Old Testament, okay? Here's what he says. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come smite the earth with a curse. You know what he's talking about? We'll find out. He's talking about John the Baptist coming preaching repentance, preparing the way for the Lord who's going to appear in his temple. So the Old Testament comes to that close talking about John the Baptist and the Messiah that is to come. There's a tribute to the Bible. And uh, I'd memorized it years ago, and I could probably say the whole thing, but I'm going to shorten it just to the part about the prophets. The tribute's about a man walking into a great temple. As he reads through the Bible, he imagines he's passing through a great temple and going to the different rooms. And when he comes to this section of the prophets, he says this, I stepped into the observatory room of the prophets where I saw many telescopes of various sizes, some pointing to far off events, but all concentrated on that bright morning star, which was soon to arise over the moonlit hills of Judea. Isn't that beautiful? I'm talking about reading through those prophets and thinking about the Christ that is to come. Well, now that's what you can expect. And then when you get to the New Testament, I'll tell you what you're going to find. You're going to find where they say oh, repeatedly, this is that which was spoken by the prophet, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. Ask Seth the prophet, and then give those quotes from these prophets. And you see, it's one of the great evidences that Jesus is the Christ, because he fulfills the prophecies. And the fact that he fulfills the prophecies not only verifies that he is the Christ, but that these holy men of old spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now, I hope that makes you want to read those prophets. If the Holy Ghost put these words into the mouths of men and they say, Thus saith 
the Lord, and it has to do with our eternity. Doesn't that make you want to read what it is that they were preaching and read those sermons? And, and I, I, it will be. Some of it's going to be hard. You'll be like that man riding in his chariot. They just say, I don't understand when I'm reading. How can I accept some man guide me? And you might need some help getting through here. But until that help comes, you'll be good to familiarize yourself with the sermons of these prophets. And then a lot of that help you're going to have when you start reading the New Testament. Beautiful, isn't it? Okay. All these things are for our benefit and for our good. We are heirs of all those things that went before all the words spoken by the prophets fulfilled in Christ so that those blessings can be ours if we'll believe and obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I want to end this lesson. If you've not been baptized into Christ, you have not yet assessed the spiritual blessings that are there for you in Christ. And so if you need to be baptized into Christ, then let that be known as we stand and sing.